Hello, sorry, I was waiting to see if I was on. Uh, it's a conference. I think this is such a cool idea. So I wanted to thank everybody who um, put so much effort into this. And thank you also for actually having me. Um, this is really, really fun. I already saw a comment in the chat about how somebody actually liked my first website, which was Pokemon Shack. So um, I really, really appreciate that so much. Uh, it's, it's really weird to think back because back then I had to fit my entire website on a 1.44 megabyte uh, and now you're probably downloading more than that in um, video um, bytes, you know, per second, just watching this stream. So I actually think that's very, very cool. So I'm going to get my presentation started and then we should be good to go. So I just need a second. But again, thank you so much um, for having me on the live coders. And I really hope that you enjoy this presentation. So, um, the title that is appearing below this stream is a very long one just because it was supposed to describe the talk in a better way. Um, however, I like to call this talk alternative interfaces. Um, and so today's topics are essentially going to be talking about some web technologies, uh, web USB, web Bluetooth and web serial. Um, but we are sort of trying to zoom out and just consider them as actual communication protocols, but actually talk about for that. Um, and that's because a lot of the time, um, and I'm guilty of this when I give hardware talks, we sort of um, introduce, you know, the talk and then all of a sudden we have this finished, um, you know, project. And sometimes it's really good to know the bits in between just so that you don't feel as intimidated. And I think it's really important to do that. So I'm trying to address that a little bit more with this talk today. I sort of have a reputation of being this hardware witch and it can be quite intimidating. So I really don't want that impression. I don't want people to think that this is impenetrable knowledge. It's really not. Um, and I'm hoping that you'll be amused and delighted today around just how anybody can really um, write a hardware protocol and anybody can start making use of these technologies. It's just a, a matter of actually like learning the stuff. So, um, this evening's topics, um, just because I know some of you are watching of that, um, is uh, vehicles, protocols, ownership, and the web agenda. This is actually what the talk is really about. So let's start off with a fun exercise. Let's say that you're working right now. Um, it's quite likely that you're working from home. And so you're just enjoying um, sitting at home, eating the food out of your own fridge. Uh, and your manager says, oh, hey, have you got a second? And you're like, oh. Okay, okay, what's up? And he says, I need you to design a protocol for this new text displaying robot that we're developing. And you say, well, okay, but I've actually never done hardware before. I do web pages. And he says, hey, it's all computers, right? Uh, just show me a proposal by end of day tomorrow. And uh, that's, that's not great. Um, like, where do you start? Well, it turns out that he's also sent a slightly more helpful email um, to you after that. And he basically says, here are the specs from the hardware engineers. Uh, this, this robot uses USB data transfer. Um, you have to create this protocol to be fast for that computer to pass. Um, but that protocol also needs to be human usable. Uh, it needs to support things like underlined text, bold text, strike through text, character fonts, uh, text justification and line feeds. Um, and one more thing, I also want to be able to patent this protocol that um, you're designing that talks from the computer to this actual text displaying robot. So don't copy any existing protocols like HTTP or RPC or anything like that, um, just to throw a spanner in the works and make it a little bit harder. And you're just like, yep, I see where this is going. Um, okay, fine. I need to keep my job. So I'm going to start doing that. So uh, what is the simplest thing that we could do in this case? Um, you know, let's not overcomplicate this. Let's just sort of like try to assemble something that might work one piece at a time. And so maybe we could use ASCII, given that this is a text displaying robot and the extended ASCII table um, is, is actually pretty good at being able to, um, you know, encompass all of the different characters we would want to um, put on this text displaying robot. But also um, it has a bunch of characters that maybe we can reuse. Um, and so if we look at the ASCII table, um, there are a number of, well, this is uh, the non-extended ASCII table, um, but if we have, 
um, a look at all of the white boxes, which are like towards, you know, um, which is most of the table. These are all kind of characters that end up being displayed. Um, and so we definitely want to use them because we want people to be able to just provide text um, and send that over USB and then the robot knows to display it, right? Um, and so there's no reason for us to, you know, do anything more complicated than that because we already have these things to actually work with. So that will work out pretty well. However, we, um, we also have all of these characters in the gray areas and they tend to be characters that won't necessarily always be something that actually displays on the screen. They're not necessarily a letter, a number, or a symbol. Um, in order to um, provide the text displaying robot with extra context, you know, so if we wanted to say, hey, uh, the next five letters are going to be bold or strike through, for example, because that's our requirements, maybe we could actually use those characters um, because it, it they're not actually needed in order for somebody to be able to um, communicate that text. And if we're sending these characters, they're still technically human readable. So if you were to look at the payloads that we're sending from the host device over the USB to a text displaying robot, then um, you know you can still debug this pretty pretty easily because again, it's just ASCII. -ed. So if we look at this table and we look at sort of the more gray boxes towards the top and then the delete at the bottom, um, we can pretty much pick arbitrarily. Um, but I think the most useful one to us, given um, that some of them actually do provide some meaning still, is the line feed. This is going to be useful for us to say, OK, take this text and go to the next line. So we definitely want to use line feed as a meaningful command in order for us to actually control where our text justification is. Um, but what about protocol structure? So pick some of these ASCII characters and just send you know, um, that as strings. So as I explained before, um, if we wanted to write hello world, um, we can just send that over to the text displaying robot. And as long as it's just a regular character, um, a human readable character, then the robot can just say, okay, well, I guess I'm just going to display that. Um, and again, when I talked about the line feed before, um, we this is how you would combine commands with actual text expression. So on the second line there, we could have hello, uh, and then the line feed character, and then world, and then the text displaying robot, which is on a new line for the last word. So, what about commands? We had all of those other um, characters in the ASCII table. Um, can we look for something that's not as meaningful as line feed um, and maybe not as meaningful as carriage return or something like that? Um, and what comes to mind is escape. I mean, what else are you going to use escape for? It sort of, it, it means something in some context, but as far as the text, I care about that. So we could probably use the escape key in order to tell the robot Anything that's after this escape key, the very next character is going to be a command. So we could do something such as uh, escape and then um, another ASCII character. And again, this could be a letter just because we already know that if we pair an ASCII character with um, the escape um, character that into a command rather than trying to print out the character that comes immediately after it. So that sort of sounds a little bit confusing. So let's just make up some of these just so that you can see an example of how this protocol would actually work. So let's say that if an E character um, came straight after um, an escape character, maybe that could be E for emphasis. And so playing robot that after the escape E sequence, any um, you know human readable ASCII characters that come after that need to be displayed in bold. We could do the same with escape G and strike through. Um, and then we could do escape and we can even just look at symbols and not just um, letters. And so, you know, a, a, a dash um, kind of feels like an underline in a weird way. Um, and so we could probably do that as well. So it's, it's really quite arbitrary and we can invent this stuff and it doesn't actually really have to make sense. Um, so let's have a look at what that would actually look like when you're sending um, these characters over USB. So um, again, hello world with an escape E at the beginning would be uh, bolded or emphasized. Escape G would be strike through um, and escape hyphen and then the words hello world would end up being an underlined one. 
Um, we can actually start getting super fancy with this too. Um, and because we need to do fonts and also justification, you know, such as is the text on the left or is it in the middle or is it on the right? Um, we can also get a little bit fancy with that. And we know that um, our bossy McBox boss fa uh, face really needs these features. So what if um, escape and M was the, um, I guess, the toggle to go into font um, uh, selection mode? And what if escape A was kind of justification um, selection mode? Now, this doesn't really solve the problem of, well, if we're in font selection mode, how do we then tell it what font to use? Um, and then if we're in justification mode, how do we tell it which justification to actually use? So we will have to complicate our protocol just a little bit more. And so what if we add a number on the end um, and everything is zero indexed? And so if we have escape plus M plus zero, um, then we know that uh, we want the text displaying robot to use the built-in font it has of like zero. So we might have five fonts and that would go from zero to four. Um, and so whenever it sees an escape and an M together, it knows now to wait for the next character because that's actually going to be um, the data it needs in order to switch over to a new font. And we could do something really similar with escape A um, and zero and left justify. And so we could do um, something such as escape A and zero for left, escape A and one for center and escape A and two for right justify. Now this is starting to become a little less human readable. However, if you're scanning these payloads um, and reading them as a human, this, once you've sort of memorized each letter um, and you've sort of memorized in your head which font is font zero and, that, and um, if we do zero, one, two, if we're actually in a culture that uses uh, left to right, um, you know, justification of, of text, then the zero and the one and the two um, kind of makes sense because you're going sequentially from left to right, left to center and then right. Um, if you were in a culture that did right to left, you might want to have those um, numbers in the opposite order so that right justification is zero, for example, center is still one and then uh, left is two. So, um, you know, you sort of went away and wrote this thing and you sort of thought, I don't even know if this is real, but like my manager's probably not even going to know the difference. Um, so you kind of just like write up the spec, um, you attach it as a PDF um, and then you ship it off. Done. That's, that's it, right? That's actually what goes into designing a, a hardware protocol to talk to a robot, right? But you're probably thinking like, is this even practical? This sounds very silly. Um, it sounds like no thought was put into it, um, but maybe it will work. Well, the funny answer to this is this uh, protocol, or, or at least the protocol we uh, wrote ourselves is actually just a small subset of the escape P, which is the Epson standard code for printers protocol. Uh, this is a real protocol. It's still used to this day. Um, I realize that not all of us are, are doing in-person payments right now, but if we are going to a restaurant and we want to pay our bill, um, most of the time the receipt that they bring by to our table um, in order to pay and sign um, is actually produced using this actual protocol still to this day. Um, so it's a printer control language de developed by Epson. Uh, it became like outrageously popular just because it was um, a pretty simple protocol and it was very quick for humans and programmers to actually learn. Um, and so it's widely supported in software. Most uh, receipt or thermal printers you buy these days s support escape P out of the box um, and it may have other protocols too. So that's actually pretty cool. So, um, is this actually useless information? Well, there are some actual fun uses of this too. It's not just for things such as printing restaurant bills or um, printing the super long receipts that you might get at the pharmacy, especially if you live in the US. Um, back in the day, the, the um, awesome company Nintendo put together this, to me, it was just like, I just could, like my imagination and my mind was just blown that they created a Game Boy cartridge that acted as a camera. And then they also paired it with this thing called the Game Boy printer. And you could actually do really cool things with it. And it actually had a game link cable. So you actually had to connect the printer physically to the Game Boy um, in order to print things. And I don't actually know if the Game Boy printer used Escape P. It probably used uh, something different, um, but it is actually pretty cool. 
And so here is what one of the printouts would actually look like. You could act you actually were able to take selfies. So this this actually um, actually came out well before smartphones and the idea of taking selfies and printing them. It came out before Snapchat, where you could add different filters and you could add different stickers and things. And so it was kind of ahead of its time. And I thought it was absolutely amazing. Um, and I actually borrowed my friend's Game Boy camera and printer because uh, I didn't actually um, have one at home and I was completely addicted to it. I thought it was the coolest thing. So can we take this, uh, by the way, it's patented, uh, SKP had a patent on it, <laughs> um, proprietary that ended up super popular, um, protocol, and, and, and can we also just take other web technologies and can we stitch them all together in order to create a web version of the Game Boy camera and the Game Boy printer? Um, well, let's, let's kind of look at our options. So webcams, such as the one that I'm using right now, um, work with browsers. Um, and we also have this really neat API available in browsers too, um, called the media stream API. So we are able to ask the user permission to get a media stream from them. Um, and that can be video and audio or just video or just audio. Um, so if you have a microphone, um, you can also use the media stream API with that. Uh, Escape P actually supports pictures. So we didn't go into that part of the protocol because it is slightly more complicated than um, just text formatting. Um, however, um, you can actually uh, do things like pictures, barcodes, QR codes, all sorts of neat stuff. Um, and most thermal printers use USB or Bluetooth, um, which means that we have two different communication interfaces that we could possibly use. Um, and it just turns out that we also have some really cool web APIs other than just get media stream, which is web USB and web Bluetooth. So what if we got one of these printers and what if we then just tried to um, connect them all together and see what actually happens. Um, so let's go over some hypothetical code that we could do this with. Um, so the first, the first thing we need to do, this is very oversimplified, but the first thing we need to do is uh, we need to specify our media options um, for when we're asking our user permissions. Uh, so we only need video in this case. So let's just ask for the least amount of permissions that we need at all times, just to respect the user privacy. Um, on line six, I am just uh, uh, awaiting a um, get user media. So that's basically awaiting the user's permission. They give permission um, and then that should hopefully resolve. Um, once they actually um, give permission, that stream um, variable will resolve into an actual media stream, which will be their video stream. Uh, and then you can essentially put a video tag or a video element on your HTML page um, and you can actually set the source of that video to be their media stream, their, their video. Um, and then you can just uh, basically make it autoplay. There are a few permission issues with autoplay in browsers, um, which is why it's important to do things like using secure URLs um, and things like that. But um, that's sort of beyond the scope of this talk today. That is probably the, the simplest boiled down example of getting someone's feed, um, but that is basically the Game Boy camera. Um, and then if we can basically take a frame of their video, uh, we can take a photo of, uh, we could basically take a photo, which is how the Game Boy camera works. The printer side, a uh, little more complex, but I tried to boil down the code as small as I possibly could. So um, the first thing we do is we use the USB API. Um, and we can do this with Bluetooth as well, but I'm starting with USB first. Uh, we request the device. Now, I haven't actually put the USB options on this code, but it's things such as um, specifying certain interfaces and configurations that you want from the printer. A lot of the time that's available in the data sheet. That is a little bit of the area of the draw the rest of the L, so I do apologize for that. Um, but most of the time I just uh, enumerate through um, and guess my uh, configuration and interfaces because sometimes the data sheet doesn't always tell you. So you can still do this even if you don't know what you're doing. Um, you can just fudge around and copy other people's options until it works. Um, and then you'll very slowly understand how USB devices actually work. Um, and so it does take a while, but this stuff kind of comes more naturally to me now after I've played with a bunch of devices. So we can then open that printer. We can select the configuration and clean the interface. Um, the configuration tends to just be things like, uh, if you have a printer and a scanner in one device, you're going to be selecting um, 
the configuration, you're either going to be selecting like the scanning configuration or you want to select the uh, printing configuration, right? So that's an example of how you can actually keep those separate in the USB um, um, implementation essentially on your device. Uh, interfaces are things like, um, can I write to this interface? Can I read from it? Um, can I do read and write? Um, and so again, sometimes you have to guess most of the time it's going to be the very first interface on a configuration. Um, so you can claim that. Um, and that just means that you alone have access to that on the computer um, and no other processes can interfere with that. Um, and so it places a lock on that interface essentially. Then on line six, um, I'm putting a message together to send over that new USB connection that we've set up. And so low, I'm splitting it into um, each individual letter. I'm then getting the character code for each letter. So again, that's the ASCII um, code or the ASCII, um, I guess, uh, number um, that we can turn into bytes, into actual character bytes. Um, and so, for example, hello returns uh, 104, 101, 108, 108, and 111. And that's like lowercase. Um, and from there, we turn that sequence of numbers into a byte array because that's uh, what the device needs in order to read it when, once we pipe it along the USB connection. Uh, and then we transfer out that payload. Now, that number five is really just um, finding the right endpoint, which is attached to that interface. So um, it can get a little bit confusing. Again, if you just enumerate each one until something happens on the device, may void your warranty, but sometimes that actually does work if you don't know what each interface um, and uh, endpoint actually needs to be. Bluetooth actually doesn't look that different. When we go between them, um, most of the lines of code are exactly the same. So um, the only thing that's changed at the top here is uh, we need to actually request the Bluetooth device. Um, we connect to it. Um, we then try to, we enumerate through all the different services and characteristics. It's actually very similar to like configurations and um, interfaces. So you can actually experiment around and um, just get services and characteristics and try writing to them and reading from them until something happens with the printer. Again, that might uh, actually void your warranty, but it's actually really fun to try. <laughs> um, the line six and seven is exactly the same. Um, we need to send the exact same payload in the exact same format. It's really just a different, it's wireless instead of a wired approach. Um, and then the last line on line 10, it, instead of um, you know, USB.transfer out uh, or printer.transfer out, it is actually, we're taking that specific characteristic and we're writing a value to it. And that value is just the payload. So once you've actually got the characteristic, it's a little less complicated. There are a few, uh, one less level to it <laughs> than there is with uh, web USB. So um, can we actually do this? Can we make a Game Boy camera and Game Boy printer using web technologies and just using a, an average thermal printer? Um, well, I have this friend of mine called Surma and um, during my regular live stream, I think November, 2018, yes. Uh, we were just like, what if we tried to build this in 90 minutes flat? What would actually happen? Would we fall on our face or would we actually do it? And so we got together in person um, and we, um, basically streamed ourselves trying to figure this out. It was super fun. Uh, I think we used web USB for this. Um, and we actually ended up with like a, a silly prototype. Um, so I sort of want to show you what happens when I take that prototype in and actually clean it up. And so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go into a demo. So, um, this here is the progressive web. Um, I'm going to share a link in the chat. So this is a progressive web boy. Um, it doesn't really have enough time to write the manual. Um, so just bear with me. Um, but if you click start, that seems like an obvious place to start. Uh, once I click start, my webcam might be a little bit interrupted just because I'm using it for two different sources right now. Um, but you can see that I uh, I can use the B button to take a photo. Um, and you can see here that it's done the regular dithering that you would normally see with a web USB device. Um, again, I'm sorry, my webcam is now lagging a little bit just because of uh, the sharing going on. So this, this should be alleviated in a second. So um, I actually have 
a and so um i can just use this if i want because it actually um escape p and it does actually speak uh what's it called uh usb and bluetooth um so i'm actually just going to try bluetooth just because it has like um it's just less complicated and i'm going to put it down for a sec we're going to go back to uh my demo i'm going to press i think select is bluetooth i think oh no maybe we can try web usb this was working perfectly yesterday of course um so i'm actually going to plug in my cable to the usb I'm very sorry for my computer falling over right now. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So here we go. Um, I'm going to do my best to hold the printer up. There we go. And I'm going to see if that actually connects and prints my photo or not. Oh, and it did. Cool. So if I click feed, go back into self. You see that? That's pretty cool. Uh, so that's how that app actually works. And now I have this cute selfie of myself. Um, we did actually put an, ori uh, an original feature place emoji stamps all over the picture at random. However, I need to build that back into the demo again. Uh, so that is not quite done. Um, and just before my computer falls over, I'm going to go back into my presentation. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to close this as well. Okay, um, one sec, and then we should be back. Okay, um, so this is what it actually did look like. So you can see that I've cleaned it up a little bit, but you can see that we were being very silly um, and we were very excited about it. And so um, this kind of stuff, again, if, if you're happy with just kind of reverse engineering a few things and playing around and seeing what happens, you can do something like this uh, with a friend in 90 minutes, which is pretty efficient when it comes to um, using web technologies to do cool stuff. Okay, so to do a quick recap, uh, web USB, web Bluetooth and web serial, they're really just vehicles to get your payload to the device. That's why I didn't want to cover them in detail today because there are plenty of guides online for how to use these technologies. I have that glitch app that you can look at the source code of. Um, and so a lot of the time, this stuff doesn't tend to be the bottleneck for people to learn. And the bottleneck actually tends to be, well, how do I talk to like this printer? Like, how do I do it? I don't understand. And, and so I wanted to introduce like more a protocol today um, rather than trying to, um, you know, explain the different communication technologies instead, right? So protocols are learnable. You can make up your own. If you think that um, escape P is pretty straightforward, you could actually make up your own protocol that's very similar to it for printers or a number of different inventions that you might um, be dreaming up for yourself. It's just bytes over USB and Bluetooth. And um, spoiler alert, uh, USB and Bluetooth are again also just protocols that have been implemented by humans and so it, if it seems impenetrable at first it's worth just googling around, searching around, uh, reading up on these kinds of technologies so that you understand what's happening under the hood and that's the most powerful part of learning this stuff is understanding how it works so you can then use your imagination and then just invent things that, that are so much cooler than what's already out there on the shelf right now. Uh, I was so heavily inspired by the Game Boy Camera and printer. I just thought that was so unprecedented at the time and it's aged so well, like looking back, it was just an absolute triumph. Um, and it's wonderful that we can now, as web developers, we don't have to write low level assembly in order to make these kinds of things. We have all of these really powerful APIs right in front of us in the browser without even having to leave <laughs> the actual browser environment or leave our, our code editors and our languages that we're already familiar with. So yeah, it's very inception-y. Um, you know, the, the protocols that we're sending over other protocols, you know, escape P is a protocol, we're sending that over USB and Bluetooth. Uh, it's very inception-y. So you're probably thinking, how come every JavaScript developer just sees JavaScript as their hammer and every single problem as their nail? 
It's not really about JavaScript. Um, it's about the fact that hardware interfaces in the past have, and, and even the present, are just really difficult to get right. They're really difficult to make. Um, and that's because they should be fast to make. They should be cross-platform. They should look good. They should be accessible. Um, and so doing that with um, sort of like older tools is just so difficult. You want to bang your head against a brick wall. The cross-platform stuff, especially using all sorts of weird like um, UI frameworks that gloss over all the different operating system, um, you know, problems also creates a challenge for you to make it look good, which also creates a massive challenge for keeping something accessible. I've found it really hard to give uh, I guess like UI frameworks on lower level languages such as C, those UI frameworks, it's really hard to make them accessible. Sometimes a screen reader just doesn't even see certain fields in your app, which is really hard. Um, and that makes it really hard to um, develop as well. So browsers are a commonly installed application on many computers. And so not asking the user to have to download all of these different, you know, like bespoke one of a kind applications just to be able to use your stuff not a great experience. Um, so giving people just a URL like I did with the Progressive Web Boy um, is a pretty good idea um, because it you're not asking a lot of them and you're still at the end of the day asking their permission to use the device. Whereas a lot of programs that you download um, onto your operating system level don't even ask you those permissions. And so I really like the security model that's starting to be built into these really cool APIs and browsers because I think it's a better experience for the user. And, and, and just to recap on what I said, um, browser-based interfaces are rapidly prototyped. They're hot patched easily. CSS is really powerful. Um, and there's a consistent accessibility tree. So it's just a lot easier to uh, develop as a result. So um, this is a line from the web USB spec, which I really enjoy it. It makes me very happy. And I think it, it should, should hopefully inspire you as well, which is like, you know, this, these kinds of specs, such as web USB, um, web USB will be good for the web because instead of waiting for a new kind of device to be popular enough for browsers to provide a specific API, here's the clincher. New and in innovative hardware can be built for the web from day one. Absolutely. A small feature that you didn't see of web USB today is if you des design your device from day one to have web usb um i guess like the maximum compatibility when someone plugs that device into their um, computer a little notification can pop up in your browser that says oh this device is recommending you go to progressivewebboy.glitch.me would you like to go there um and so Neat little features such as that just make it like such a nice experience. And again, like new and innovative hardware can be built from for the web from day one. So now that I've hopefully got you excited about building your own stuff, getting out old devices, reverse engineering them, um, and just kind of like taking back your own ownership of like what you can actually do with devices and not having to rely on manufacturers um, and companies to actually define that. Here's where I think it's really good to talk about ownership really quickly um, and right to repair and things like that. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about one example that I think is concerning, um, but there are, this is a really large topic area. So a lot of people have smart home devices in their home. Um, you know, IoT is starting to bleed into people's um, living spaces. You're probably pretty acutely aware of this right now if you're working from home a lot during this time. Um, and I just absolutely detest these devices for a few different reasons. Um, one is that it's this one size fits all for everybody. And two, it is companies that say they're speaking to users and asking them what they want, but they are largely defining what these devices are and what the functionality is. And you can't, they're, they're just inert. You can't really change them. You can add different skills and things like that. but. Other than the really nice accessibility things for certain people who can, um, you know, control things in their house without if they have mobility issues, I just really think that these things are not worth the privacy issues that um, that come up in them. And they're just still not a, a natural interface. And, and we're not defining how we want to actually interact with it. We're just given this thing and expected to work with it. And so... Another part of this is also just that these devices are bleeding into spaces that used to be free of these kinds of privacy concerns. Um, and so in 1985, just, just for context, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, 
uh, allocated the frequency band between 902 and 928 megahertz to industrial, scientific, and medical. Okay, so industrial, scientific, uh, scientific, sorry, medical devices, important devices, um, hopefully designed by companies that care a lot about privacy, but also care a lot about things like security um, and things that are actually useful and do things for people. But then um, as a secondary um, basis, it was also allocated to the amateur radio service. Um, and so if you're a ham radio um, technician and you've passed the exam, you can actually use these uh, specific bands in the 900 megahertz frequency um, for um, basically communication, emergency services, um, things like that. It's something that I'm really, really passionate about. Um, one of my activities uh, during this uh, stay at home uh, mandate is is to get my amateur radio uh, handbook back out and, re and restudy it because I'd like to get my license. Um, it's something that I care deeply about because it is something that belongs to the public. It is for us. It has been uh, allocated by the FCC. And so um, this has been changing a little bit with um, new, uh, I guess, like licensing um, uh, proposals coming into the 900 megahertz band. Um, and so we're starting to see things like um, broadband communications and also proprietary communications that are not necessarily industrial, scientific or medical um, coming into this band. Are they being given licenses to operate in this band? And so um, you might not recognize this um, particular photo and where it's from, but it's actually from um, an Amazon conference that happened last year um, in the in the fall uh, in the US fall. Sorry, that would have been in the spring if you're in the southern hemisphere. And basically, um, it's called Sidewalk, um, the, and they're showing a map of basically the coverage area that they got. So they're switching from, essentially, Amazon is switching from Wi-Fi devices um, and Bluetooth over to this 900 megahertz band, and they're coming up with their own protocol for it. Um, and so Amazon employees installed these smart home devices that were everything from dog tags to um, try to locate your dog um, to just like other general kind of home assistant devices that we already see and own these days. Um, and so they, they gave them to a bunch of Amazon employees. It was several hundred employees. They installed their de these devices around their home as typical customers do. And in just days, these the individual network points combined. So this is a mesh network um, infrastructure. So each device basically is it performs as part of a mesh. Um, and so they basically um, combined all these individual points, which is all these devices, to support a secure low bandwidth 900 megahertz, ne uh, megahertz network for things like light sensors and all sorts of stuff. It covered most of the Los Angeles basin. Um, again, if, you, if you're not familiar with Los Angeles, one of the largest metropolitan regions in the United States, that's a huge area where a private company uh, created this protocol called Sidewalk and is going to be owned, operated, and controlled by a single company. Um, and they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily have to open it up for other developers to develop against. They don't have to explain or open source that protocol. It's just that if you have neighbors or anybody that installs these devices, um, you are basically in that net mesh network right now. Um, and there's not a lot that you can do about it. And frequency jammers are currently illegal. So you, you can't even try to block these devices um, if you don't agree uh, with this being a new network that's um, that's being allowed on the 900 megahertz band. And again, I know that um, amateur radio um, has secondary um, access to it, but I just, I, I feel quite territorial about this. Um, and so when you put these devices that really just don't really help people that much, um, and also are just like basically mass produced, it makes me just want to scream that I want less mass produced rubbish and more Harry Potter magic. Um, so I'm going to share some examples of people who I think are kind of taking this back um, and reowning it and doing really good things with devices that don't have to be these surveillance devices. They don't have to be intrusive. They don't. They can be like bespoke to yourself, um, and and they can be something that you can discover how they work for yourself. Um, and I think that's really beautiful. And so Samantha Gold, um, a really good friend of mine, I just love everything she does. Um, she gave this talk a few years ago called Crafting a Connected Home, and it's just like absolutely witty and very clever. Um, I will link to that if I can find the link. Um, 
But she makes these really lovely home devices that are supposed to blend in with your environment. They're not supposed to be this giant microphone sitting on, you know, your mantelpiece. Um, and so she made this stained glass window that had one pane that can be electronically changed so that you can uh, turn the pane dark or you can turn the pane light. Um, and she framed it and hung it up in her window and it looked very beautiful. And basically the pane would just go dark if it was going to rain so that she knew whether or not she could take her bike out um, to ride to work or whether she should get the bus instead. Um, and it was just such a simple binary thing. It's just like a, an on or an off. And I just, it's, it's just part of your environment. It feels very Harry Potter. It feels like something that's personal to you. And I think that's really beautiful. And I'm recognizing the privilege here that a lot of, pe uh, a lot of people don't have the spare time or the knowledge or the resources to create things like this. But I think that we need to be better at thinking about having a better imagination about these kinds of things. So that is a really good example. Um, Simone Yurtz, I don't know if you know about her. She's absolutely fantastic as well. Um, she has created um, this completely offline. It doesn't need the internet. It absolutely does not. And so it doesn't have it. It's basically um, just a, a goal tracker. And so if you say to yourself, hey, I'm going to do 10 minutes of meditation every single morning, uh, or I am going to um, go for a walk every day, or I am going to um, drink, I don't know, eight ounces of water a day or something like that. Uh, you can basically just like mentally subscribe to that idea and then use this, um, this board in order to check that off uh, every day. And it's this beautiful feeling where the, the PCB is a wonderful design where you just touch the little, um, the little daily um, dot and then it lights up and then you get that lovely dopamine rush of having completed that task. Um, this again, so simple, so elegant, lots going on behind the scenes, but I can imagine this becoming like an heirloom item that you pass down to your kids so that they can track um, things that they want to improve in their lives. Um, it's just something beautiful. It's, it's not complicated to use. It doesn't use the internet. You're not competing with people. You're not adding friends and being in competition with each other. Like, oh, who did their dot today? It's just for you. It can be part of your furniture. It can blend in with your environment and uh, it's extremely harmless. I think it's really beautiful. So again, less mass produced surveillance rubbish, more Harry Potter magic. Hopefully that's inspired you as well. Again, the progressive web boy is very silly, um, but it was a wonderful exploration that Soma and I were able to do. And I think it really enriched our lives. It made us excited about programming again. So hopefully that's inspired you too. Um, so here are the resources for uh, A lot of the things that I explained today, uh, if you go to progressivewebboy.glitch.me, you'll need to go to the secure. So please go to, uh, here are some links as well if you want to screenshot that quickly before I duck out. Um, and that's my talk today. So if you have any questions and we, if we have any time, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and yeah, again, thanks to LiveCodes.com for having me. This has been really great. Okay, so first question is, can you repeat, uh, from Bold Clap, can you repeat the name and model of the printer? Um, was, <laughs> um, I sort of just bought it randomly online. Um, and so I, what I can do is I can hold this up. If you wanted to screenshot that, you could probably do the model number. Um, so if you, if you, just look up thermal printer and you click on it usually uh any any results sorry online um sorry my webcam is really good um so if you if you click on any results escape AP, and it will tell you if it's bluetooth and web usb as well or sorry just regular usb um and so most of the time you just need to look for those details this was 25 dollars us and i paid probably a premium just to have a really cute small one um, you know, that has a, it has a rechargeable battery, um, is a really nice one. Um, but you can get uh, much more affordable ones than that as well. Thank you for the question, Bold Club. That was a good one. Uh, the Hugo doll, have you used, looked into the Xbox adaptive controller? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> oh, I have one. Yeah. So I, I have been, um, let me find my 
breadboard. Do I have a breadboard for me here? Oh my god, okay. So, um, here is my breadboard work in progress um, for it. So I have a Raspberry Pi uh, and I have a little transistor um, plugged into this breadboard. And what I'm doing is the Raspberry Pi to programmatically turn, uh, um, send current to that transistor switch that into my Xbox adaptive controller. So the whole point of this controller is you can make your own switches and buttons to make things more accessible for you uh, if you have uh, different needs. And so that's the little, that's all the button pinouts, which is a 3.5 millimeter thing. So yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. Thank you, Hugo Dahl. Yes, uh, I've been playing with that. So I want to make voice activated buttons and I want to make a uh, mind like brainwave um, controlled buttons as well. That's sort of what I'm going to be doing with that. So yeah. Is there a link to this uh, crafting a connected home? Yes. So um, Samantha, oh, she's so good. Samantha did this talk as part of, let me find it for you, as part of the Etsy code as craft. Um, I'm just looking it up for you now. Uh, Codus Craft Goldstein. So I realize that's probably hard for you to look up. So I'm looking it up for you. Oh no, I can't find it. Um, if you look up Etsy Code as Craft, they have like the previous videos. Um, I'm going to just see if I can drop a link in there. So they have a blog, but if you click on the speaker series, uh, you might actually be able to find her talk. So uh, it's super good. Um, it was a little while ago. So I'm scrolling down trying to find it, um, but you, you just need to... I don't see it. I'm really sad. Okay, I don't know if it's there, but I can track down Sam and try and find it for you. Um, but yeah, thank you for the question. I'm, I'm really sorry. I think that's why I didn't include a link because I couldn't find it. Uh, it's Litany. I don't think this would have been... Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I tried to put enough variety in the talk. So even if you're not really a coder, uh, you can still learn about like um, some of the other things that people can do with this kind of technology. So uh, I appreciate that. And I did inject a lot of my opinions in it about the amateur radio spectrum, but at the same time, um, again, I think it's kind of fun to talk about these kinds of things. I have all the cool toys. Yes, <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, cool. So that's all we, me. So again, thank you.